Hi, and welcome to part one of our Bar Institutional Partnerships workshop series. Uh, we're so glad you could join us here today. And the title of our series today is First Steps Towards a New Bar Exam. I'm here with my colleague, Professor Ryan Williams, Director of Legal Programs here at Kaplan Bar. Thanks for joining me, Ryan. Thank you, Kimberly. I would love, before we get started and dive in into our conversation here today, um, if you wouldn't mind just sharing with our guests a little bit about your background and experience. I'm sure. Thank you. I've been a law professor for over 12 years now. I guess it's getting up there a little bit, but that's all right. And you still look bad. Bar, well, no, thank you. <laughs> trying, right? Trying. Um, <laughs> the last five years or so with Kaplan, as um, soon as I started teaching some bar subjects um, at my school and saw how hard the bar exam was out there in California, I was like, I want to do more and help students pass the bar because it's my pet peeve. You go to school for three years, it's not cheap, and then you can't pass the test at the end. So we don't want that. And so now if the bar is changing, we want to help with that too. So happy to be here. Thank you, Kimberly. Thanks so much, Ryan. I know that many, many of our viewers may also recognize you from the many, many uh, videos that you're on and for not only uh, Capital Complete Bar Review, but also many of our institutional programs in NPRE. So you are a familiar face and, and I know you're gonna bring us some great conversations here today. The conversations that I know that I've been having and that it's been such a hot topic in, it's not only the details of how and when it may be implemented, but most thoughtfully exchanges about what can we do to support the possibility of exam change in our schools? How do we support students now to help them prepare if our jurisdiction adopts the next gen exam or creates its own? And what can you do, Kaplan or, or anyone that they're talking to? How can you help us now? Um, and these questions, I think, are just fantastic and they're seeking guidance and support. But they're also pretty much laden with stress and anxiety. And I think for all of us, the idea of something new and different um, creates a little bit of stress and a little anxiety that we might have to change how we do things. But the purpose of our conversation here today and, and the rest of the series is to really open the door to a bigger discussion um, and a sharing of ideas, which our community does so well. So everyone get ready, look to your left, look to your right. Everyone is seeking the same information um, and, and guidance and support. So we're, we're here to help today and hopefully you walk away with some great ideas. Uh, to kick us off, you know, Ryan, I'd love for you to walk us through the the goals that we have today um, as we start? Yeah, well, I think the first goal when you can take back uh, to your faculty is to create a sense of urgency that we do need to start doing things now. Like even though we don't know exactly what the bar is going to look like, change is coming for sure. And, you, and we're going to have to do something different. Like most states use the UBE. Most states probably aren't going to create their own bar exam. And even states that already are non-UBE, you still use the MBE and the MBE is going away. And so it's going to be different. So it's time to start thinking about, let's do some things differently. And we don't have no guidance. We have some. And so really the NCBE said they're going to be ready with the test in 2026 in the summer. Even if we don't get all the information when they say we will, and we don't get enough lead time, they're still going to roll out the new test in the summer of 2026. And so it, it very well, very may well be that we don't get what we want to know in time. And so we can't wait till we have all the information to start making changes now. So your incoming class this fall, 2023, may very well take the next gen bar. So we need to be ready. All right, well, let's kick off with that, that first goal you mentioned as we start talking about the importance of starting now, um, creating that sense of urgency. And I'll say, I feel like it's a really mixed reception so far um, to whether it be the next gen exam or the idea of creating a new state specific exam, depending on you know where you're viewing with us today. Um, but there seems to be a dedicated group that are like, we're ready. We want to start now. We don't want to get caught, you know, holding the bag, <laughs> if you will, um, knowing that it's going to be a bit of an uphill battle, depending on you know your faculty or depending on your administration. Um, and and those that we can kind of call, you know, those that need a little nudge. 
<laughs> um, so why don't we talk and, and kind of get started here today talking about um, for those who are ready to take action and likely those who are joining us here today, what can they do to give, you know, those who need a little nudge in the right direction, right? Well, you, you can tell them that there are some things we know and don't know, right? So it's like, oh, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like then. Yes, we don't know exactly, but we know no trust in estates, no family law, right? Probably no questions on the UCC. And we know there's going to be no MBE. So we know those things aren't going to be on the test. We also know it's going to be more focused on skills um, and it's going to be less on memorization. And so there are some things we know. So like already we can be like, okay, maybe family law is required now. Maybe, you know, trust in estates is required. Maybe it doesn't need to be, or it's an elective or because it's still, these are all important classes, but maybe we reshape how we think them and teach it a little differently if you know it's not going to be tested on the bar anymore. For example, when I taught CivPro initially, CivPro wasn't on the MBE. And so I used only essays to teach it because they'll never have to answer a multiple choice question for civil procedure. And then I think it was 2015 that changed or something. And then suddenly like, oh, I knew that was coming. So anticipating that change, I started ahead of time testing multiple choice in civil procedure because I knew the test was going to change. And it wasn't, I wish they would have asked me, but it wasn't about me. Like it was changing whether I liked it or not, but I wanted to get ahead of it and start changing the way I teach it now for what's coming in the future. So what do you think the best messaging you know, for those who are, are, are in a similar position? They're, they're excited about at, at least, you know, getting started on this journey, um, knowing that, you know, they, that we didn't get asked, you know, about this in, in any respect, you know, collectively as a community, it was, you know, this is where we're going. I know there's a lot of jurisdictions that, that are state specific that use the MBE and the examiners have said, Hey, with the new next gen exam, as we move towards that, eventually we're going to stop servicing the MBE. So what would be the message that you think would be, I guess, the most positively received in kind of creating this sense of urgency for those who don't, don't have it yet? Well, the thing we know is something's going to change, right? The tests won't be the same. So since you know change is coming, you don't want to do the same thing, even if it's been working for something that for sure is going to change. And so we know we need to do something. So let's at least probe and explore what we think it might be, right? Because you know, for sure, even if you're non-UBE, the test is going to change and still be different. And so since the bar exam is going to be different, we probably need to do some things differently in preparing our students. It's always important to be proactive rather than reactive, right? You don't, and, and at the end of the day, if we sit in the camp that needs a nudge or more in the, you know, I'm not going to deal with this until I have to, or until we know all the information, um, you know, that that's not a, a service to the student, right? The idea here is let's make sure that they're getting your very best, whether you're a faculty, whether you are administration, you want to make sure that student journey is not only a positive one, but that also their questions are answered. They know what the school is doing to help support them as these changes are coming. No, totally. And if you like, if you wait until you're totally ready, like I tell my students, like they don't want to take their trust in estates essay until they fully know trust in estates. So if I wait until I know everything, I'll be waiting for five years before I take that essay. Like you, if we wait until we fully know exactly every detail, what the bar is going to look like, we might be waiting until June, 2026. And that's too late, right? So we need to start something now. That's definitely a little too late. Well, it sounds like we might be able to help everyone who's with us today or who joins us later on to dive into navigating a path of how to implement long-term change. Um, I know that can be a little treacherous and it usually gives everybody a little, a little bit of, of stress, but I know for me, if I can lay out a plan and plan for, you know, what's coming up this week, this month, you know, the year ahead, it really helps settle my anxiety. So as we look at those big long-term plans, how do we lay the groundwork um, for those long-term changes and shift to a skills focus, which is the focus obviously of the next gen bar exam and, and likely a greater focus for those that are developing their own state-specific exams? No, thank you. Great question. Like, what can we do now for long-term planning? Well, let's take what we know. The bar has said they're going to test specifically in the areas of client counseling and advising, 
client relationships and management, more legal research and writing, and more negotiations. So that's what's coming, right? They're going to de-emphasize memorization and test those skills more. So what we could do right now across our faculty see um, those skills, where are they being taught? In what classes and to what extent? And also see like maybe those skills aren't being taught anywhere. Maybe we only have a negotiations class once every other year, two credits, one semester adjuncts if we can find them situation. Maybe after we, maybe we need to do more, right? So you do that sort of internal review figure out what we're doing and what we're not doing, and then plan, okay, what do we need to prioritize? What do we need more of? Maybe we need to develop courses that cover things that are missing. Start doing that now. Get those courses approved and start thinking about who can teach them. External, internal, like you take survey of your, you know, your current faculty. Could you teach a negotiations and mediations class if you needed to? like hypothetically, but it's not hypothetically. We're probably going to need it, right? So start thinking about that now because we know that like curricular change is not does not happen overnight. Start those wheels moving now, but not just going blindly with the skills that the NCB said are going to be tested on the next gen bar. Figure out what you have, figure out what you have first. I think that's some really great advice. Um, looking at, I, I, I kind of think of it as an audit. I know that might not be a friendly term to everyone, but I think what, what you said was probably a, a better term for selling it to your administration and faculty. Self-reflection. That in, there you go, a self-reflection exercise um, or an internal review. Uh, I see a very large spreadsheet being built <laughs> that has all of the courses taught, subjects, and who's teaching it? Are they adjunct? Are they, you know, full-time faculty? Um, and being able to kind of fill in the gaps and say, take stock, we may already have everything we need. And that would be incredibly, I think, reassuring to everyone as they, you know, they're feeling the urgency and we're doing something, we're taking action, but we're good. We have a lot of this already. And making smaller changes and knowing, hey, we only have to create a few classes. We only have to put a few in development and go through, you know, the curriculum committee process. Uh, we only have to budget for two new professors um, because that's the only thing that, that we would need. So I think there's a lot of, it sounds like a lot of collaboration that could really benefit, um, you know, just taking stock in the first place. Uh, where do you really see when you look at kind of this internal review what level of classes do you think um, or, or would you recommend our colleagues prioritize? Well, look at what's not going to be tested and then what you think is coming, right? So if it's no longer, you know, trusts and estates and no longer family law, I'm like, okay, maybe those don't need to be required courses if they are. And maybe like we need to rethink or we're allowed to if you want and teach a little differently because you know it's not going to be tested in the bar. So it gives you more freedom to do what you want and maybe more skills focus there. Maybe that's an area where you can put more skills in because it's not going to be, you know, knowledge-based tested on the bar, like in any, you know, specific sense. Um, and also like legal research and writing, is it, you know, who teaches that? Is it a semester only? Should it be a year long now? Do we need more people teaching it? How big are those sections of legal research and writing? Are they huge? Could they be smaller? Do we need to start thinking about hiring more faculty for that? Or existing faculty, you used to teach it back when, could you maybe pick up a section now? Because maybe that's going to be emphasized more on the bar going forward. It looks like it will. So those areas in particular, what's not going to be tested and maybe prioritizing more, what is? I think that it sounds like that there's a lot we can do now that might kind of calm some nerves <laughs> and, and help everyone really take stock. I think a lot of our partner schools, a lot of schools across the country are already working towards putting forward, I think everyone's goal is to put out and graduate students who can go into practice, whatever that might look like for them, and to come equipped with the skill set to do that. Um, as far as, you know, as we look at long-term planning, I think it's important to reinforce, you know, one idea, and that's this first you know, pass that we might need to make some long-term changes. We might need to make some new classes. You might need to reapproach how you teach your class. Um, 
but it doesn't have to be perfect the first try. That's kind of the beauty of if we start now, as we as we deal with the whole kind of sense of urgency idea. If you start now making these changes, there there can be lots of time to really make this what needs to be. What what kind of advice do you think you've got along those lines? Um, similar to what you said, that's another benefit of starting looking at this now. And so I'm like, oh, I'm going to teach you know, family law differently now, maybe I'm going to have more client interaction or more simulations in that sense now. And exactly, you know, do I know exactly how to do that now? Maybe not, but you can try some things and figure it out before, you know, those students for sure in one year or two years are going to take a different test. And so now is the time to start um, tinkering with that and playing with that situation. And teaching skills doesn't mean you you sacrifice substance. It doesn't have to be that way. And I think that's what we might end up with here today, but like, I don't want people to think if I'm teaching skills that I can't give them the doctrinal message that they need. And that's just not true. And so we want to try to disavow people of that knowledge too. And especially if the bar is going that way anyway. Thanks, Ryan. I know that uh, you and I've had a lot of conversations about this, that um, as we kind of look at the two groups, if you will, uh, oftentimes in that group that might need a little nudge, um it comes from feelings you know for faculty especially that they don't want their academic freedom infringed upon i'm a tenured faculty member i you know i've been teaching towards this way for 20 years and i'm not going to do it any differently or the messaging of we don't teach to the bar exam here you know we 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 don't teach to a test i'm teaching you this you know subject matter and the scope of it to you know, grow your mind. What do you say to those that are kind of in the resistance camp? No, and I I understand that too, right? You get a law professor, you're like, I'm not. You understand? Know, I already have slides done. Like I have, I have the joke right here that always kills. Why would I want to change that, right? And so, and the academic freedom, like, it's like you can't like tell me what to do and say I should teach this way. But like, again, they didn't they didn't ask me, and the test is changing whether I like it or not. Well, first of all, and second, but. What is it changing to, right? A lot of times when people would complain and say, I don't want to teach to the bar, I have some understanding of that. If the bar is a 200 question, multiple choice test, seven subjects in a swirl, 1.8 minutes per question, that's not what real lawyering is, the MBE. But if you tell me, no, the bar is not going to be the MBE for anyone anymore, and it's going to be more practical lawyering skills, client counseling, negotiation, leader, legal research and writing, well, that is what lawyers do. Well, if that's what teaching to the bar is, then yes, I want to do that. And you can call it whatever you want, but it really is getting lawyers, getting you know law students ready to be lawyers, getting them practice ready. And for most law schools, that's the idea generally to get your law students ready to be lawyers. So if that's what it means to teaching to the bar, then I'm all for it because that definition has changed, right? Because now the bar is going to be different. So I'd, I'd respond to them with that. If they say, I don't want to teach to the bar, yeah, but it's a different bar and it's practical skills that maybe we should be teaching anyway. I definitely think so. Uh, I know that the idea of experiential learning has become so prevalent and for good reason. We want to make sure that we're graduating and producing, you know, practice ready lawyers, no matter what career they end up pursuing. You want to have the confidence. That that's happening but i think what we're all collectively probably agreeing upon at this point is that it takes integrating and bolstering those skills and introducing what those skills look like from a much earlier time looking at the 1l and 2l space um instead of just saying you know we, we've got a bar class we do the 3l year you know i hope that hope does, they take care you know, of it you, yeah. right right so I hope that everyone has found kind of the strategies you've laid out so far really helpful. Um, looking at that long-term planning and kind of trying to help quell the um, you know <laughs> the resistance. We, we have many Star Wars jokes here. Uh, <laughs> they can they can they can quell the resistance if you will. But I know what probably a lot of you know those of us that are joining us today are interested in is what can I do now. What can I do now? Either what can I go present at the faculty meeting on Tuesday, or how can I? I've got friends in a few different departments. How can I gain some allies? What can I give them now? What ideas can we start 
populating to help get things moving now that doesn't involve the path to the curriculum committee. I, I played life with my children last night and there's, there's the two paths you can take. And I, I, we all know the journey of the curriculum committee. That's the long path around. <laughs> so if you can, let's dive into subject specific. What can we do now or what ideas can we offer um, to our allies in different departments of ways to integrate skills now um, that doesn't require an entire rework of their class? Right. Great question. So what can we do now? And so, for example, in torts, right? I teach torts and I often have them form groups that turn into like mini law firms. And then they have problems throughout the semester that they approach as if they're lawyers in a law firm. And so they have to ask questions and get some of the information. It's like a lot of times they know the law, but do you know the right questions to ask to get the information you need? I only give them half the information from the other side. And so what questions should you be asking? And it's like, oh, well, were they third party criminally trespassing? It's like, no, it's not whether they were, it's whether the defendant knew they were because knowledge creates duty. And so you you use like, how well do you know the law? Like I I'm glad you memorized your outline and you can spit that back, but do you know what facts are missing, right? When you get only half of a story, if you really know the law, you know what questions to ask, the legally significant facts that are missing and asking for those, teaching that skill, which oftentimes law school doesn't do as much of, right? So that skill we can teach, that can be in torts, it can be in contracts, you can be like, you know, I know this contract. It was oral. Oh, it needed to satisfy the statute of fraud. So if it's an oral contract, that's not going to work. And it's like, but do they have part performance? It's like, well, I didn't, I didn't really ask. I didn't ask that. I didn't ask if there was part performance to satisfy, you know, undo the, you know, make it okay. It didn't need to be in the statute of frauds. And so they don't always think about what to ask, what they don't, you know, realize what they don't know. So help them do that through exercises in class right now. And let's let's say they do then get the information. They ask the right questions. Yay, I have the information. In evidence though, it's not always about what actually happened. It's what you can get in front of the jury, right? What can be admissible in court? And so I have the information, but what if, you know, it's not, you know, your client told you that they heard from another person that their best friend said they saw this. And you're like, okay, good. I can go with that. No, not good. You can't go with that. That sounds like multiple levels of hearsay. Like you need to ask that question in a different way. You need a different source from that. It might need to be in an affidavit. Like that needs, you can't just, that evidence is not admissible in the form in which you have it, right? And so even in, and lastly, I'll just talk about civil procedure. What could you do there? Sometimes you do discovery exercises there where again, they're trying to get information from the other side. But here it's about, did you ask the right question? Was it vague and ambiguous? Was it unduly burdensome? Did you ask it in a way and such that when you talk to your lawyer, did he tell you to like, no, no, no. If you ask a question that way, they're not going to have to answer because it's going to be protected by attorney-client privilege. And so I have them, I give them half the facts and they draft discovery responses. And then I object, you know, a lot to them because their questions aren't great because, you know, they're one L's. And then I show them, if you had asked the questions in an unobjectionable way, Here's the information you could have received. And I make it like super juicy, like they totally would have won their case, but they didn't find that information out from the other side. There's like five smoking guns on the other side of the, you know, on the other side, whether they're defendant or plaintiff, there's tons of stuff you could get from the other side. If you just ask the questions, one, did you think about what to ask legally from whether it's a torts or contracts perspective? And then two, now in civil procedure, did you ask it in an unobjectionable way? And so there are things you can do right now Everything I just said doesn't need a major curricular change. I don't have to go to a committee and get a change. You can do that All right now in your classes, thinking ahead, oh, the next gen bar is coming. This is probably going to help them. Those are all really great ideas. I love when we can integrate um, just a couple different layers for students. I think there's there will be you know faculty members that are they've been teaching you know towards the contracts or evidence a certain way for a long time and i think that we've all learned through the years whether it's you know trial by fire in your first years of practice or otherwise that gaining this experience earlier getting that opportunity in the academic environment to engage 
and learn this way where, you know, I know, I know what some students are going to say, it's not safe. It's my grade, <laughs> but so it safer really is, if it's your clients. So safer. <laughs> I'd rather it happen in that, in that safe space than, you know, when you, you know, get, a, you lose a case because you didn't know the right question to ask. Um, a lot of what you were going through in the different subjects really reminded me of, you know, an intake form or, you know, that initial client interview that happens where you're deciding, do I take this case or not? What, what type, you know, if you're, you know, the intake manager for a large law firm, which department am I sending this to? What type of case is this? And it sounds like they can really get some great experience, especially in that 1L space, um, you know, strengthening these skills without a whole lot of, um, you know, not, it, it would not be very, yeah. right. It would be very siloed to, you know, we could literally just operate this in torts or in contracts because there's some really natural alliances or civil procedure discovery questions um, that could work out. But I know as we, as we go to the opposite of being siloed uh, <laughs> that you are working on a project for the summer, um, kind of a, a pilot opportunity to, to bring some skills in and do some cross-functional collaboration. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so this summer, I'm excited, going to work with legal writing and property professors, and I'm going to teach torts, and we're going to come up with a joint problem that can go across all three of the subjects uh, throughout at least their first semester and maybe the whole year, right? And so like, it, it can help in so many ways, and you can see the natural synergies, like it can be a property, maybe you know landowner duties from the torts end, and then have some motions back and forth, and it can change, and we might give them this many facts to start and then add facts as we go to the problem and have different legal research and writing activities that they can do based on the same fact pattern. And it can show them that like, it's not just law school is just four different unrelated subjects and it, nothing relates to it. It's all different. And like, no, it it's all part of the same thing. It's all part of lawyering. And next gen wise, they've said there's going to be like fact patterns that have more than one thing going on and more than one question and modality of question from that singular fact pattern. So it also helps prepare them for what they're going to see on the new test that's coming. But students also will probably welcome this, right? It's more organic learning, right? It's not just fact pattern, read, case brief, come with that. Like it's not hypothetical so much. It's a problem that crosses lots of different subject areas and they can see how, okay, property and torts can have some overlap. You could probably do this with property and contracts too. And then have a legal writing component to anything you're talking about and have that um, bridge between the subjects. So again, like you said, we're not just siloed. And I like to, I teach two subjects. Don't ask me about anything else. Even if that's true, you could work on a joint problem with other people, right? And so uh, we're going to try that and see how it goes. And the beauty is we're going to try that now and see how it goes. And it's early enough. If we need to tinker with it and make it better, we have time to do that. I absolutely love that idea. I think it would be, I think many, many faculty members would welcome that thread of consistency, especially if we're looking in the 1L space um, at how can we not only integrate skills in a way that, again, we do not have to go to the curriculum anymore, we not have to completely redesign, but more the idea of how do I work with my friend who teaches torts and I also teach the pro and how do we build something um, that would get not only the students excited, but help them understand the material more. So that's really great. But I know you you mentioned really the next gen exam and where there's something new there and that I know they've discussed the opportunity potentially for professional responsibility to be integrated in these in these multi-topic, uh, multi-skill type questions. Um, but there's some examples of that already out there. So why don't you share a little bit about how, how PR could be uh, integrated here as well? Well, from teaching so many years in California, on the California bar exam, the only thing you know for sure that's going to be tested on the essay every year is professional responsibility. And so you can go and download, you know, many years worth, right, of professional responsibility essays, and they're not always standalone. Oftentimes, California has them cross over with other subjects property, wills and trusts, contracts, towards any subject, 
can lend itself, unfortunately, to shady lawyering, right? And so there's always a guy, yeah, I'll take the case, but I don't, I do not know this area of law at all. And I'm not going to ask any help, but yes, I need the check. So I'm going to take the case. Okay. Duty of competence. Like that's not okay. Like you can have PR issues and commingling, no matter who your client is, or whatever the subject is. And so we can, you know, we have examples of, we don't have to recreate the wheel. We have examples of they're out there for us. Here's a fact pattern that's PR and something else and lots of different something else's. And so if that's what's coming on the next gen part two, we can take, we already have some one page fact patterns that have crossover with PR already in it. I knew you'd have some answers for me on that one. Uh, really, try, try. you know, this, this, oh, and this has been really helpful. And I hope everyone who, you know, has kind of been along on, on, on our journey with us here today is feeling one excited because they're here, they're ready to take steps to support their students and to support their faculty and their administration and really look at integrating change. And that's gonna require some collaboration. It's gonna require that, that nudge to those who need to get on, get on board and come along with us and that there's gonna be a new exam no matter what. No matter where you are, it's gonna look different than it does now. So we can't wait to start preparing until we know exactly what that's going to look like because then it'll be too late it'll be too late for our students it'll be too late to you know go that long path on the game of life through the curriculum committee <laughs> for the new classes and also there's gonna be some talent out there that needs to be hired um depending on your school and what classes you currently you know provide and how frequently you provide them so i really want i appreciate you helping um brainstorm um but i hopefully you shared some really great subject specific ideas, um, planning ideas that everyone can use as a takeaway. And so like, okay, I'm going to start my spreadsheet. <laughs> I know what, I know really what to label it and where to start and know that whether it's, we're going to get started, I'm going to go to the faculty committee on Tuesday and we are going to have a meeting where we talk about what can we be doing over the summer to plan for a new idea of what these classes could look like a fresh take, if you will. Um, involving a little bit more of that experiential learning and that great value add. Um, but before, before we close for the day, do you have, what, what are the takeaways that you'd really like um, everyone to walk away with here today? Oh, um, takeaways, I think long-term, you know, do that sort of assessment right now. Where is your school at now? What skills are being tested and where, and what's missing? Find out the gaps. You can then step two, plan to fill them in, right? Um, and also that you saw, hopefully, there's some things we can do right now, starting next fall, if you want to, ways to integrate skills in so many different classes and in different ways, and maybe even combine with legal research and writing and have a problem that's themed throughout the semester or year, working with other subjects, if you want. And I guess, finally, if there's still resistance, right, if they don't love all the, this is a good way to do it because it helps make them practice ready. I mean, more practice ready. They're never practice ready, but more practice ready than now, right? If none of that works with your faculty and administration, and they're just like, no, um, you can let them know other schools are doing this now, though. Like you can use FOMO. You can be like, I mean, so if we don't, we might get left behind, right? And so other schools are doing this because they know it's coming. You don't really want to position yourself in 2025 to try to hire people and you can't find them and they're taken and you're, you're scrambling at the end to get the competitive juices going as well. So, Thanks, Ryan. I hope that helps. And, and you know, no one wants a case FOMO. So <laughs> we hope everyone will join us um, for part two, which is coming soon of our series, and that this will also foster some discussion. We want to hear from you. Part two will be coming soon. Um, we'll be discussing assessments, which I know is a super hot topic. Uh, I know a lot of a lot of our colleagues who are joining us here today are, are uh, writing on that as we speak. We'll be discussing some collaboration. So we'll take today's ideas and expand on those. Ryan already gave some great ideas of how to really increase that collaboration, both between the faculty, bar success, academic success, how we can make this you know, journey a reality with fewer pain points. And of course, looking at internalization in the digital age um, with uh, the changes that are coming. I know the idea of memorization or internalization as the sole 
you know, necessity for preparing for the bar exam is no longer going to be the go-to, but we know that our students today have some challenges when it comes to internalization. Um, so we want to make sure that we have a great discussion on that. Thank you, Ryan, for helping and for joining us and giving such wonderful advice here today. And thank you to everyone who joined us. We hope to see you soon. Please feel free to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much.